what you suggest seems very attractive and very uh, painless almost. Why doesn't the system do what you say it should do? What, what is there an economic interest in not doing what you uh, suggest? Is there, what, what is the rationale that the that we don't that the arguments are limited by what you see as the Democratic and Republican positions that are contra contradict. If, if what you were saying is accurate, why not grab it? Well, I think you have to press the button. So I think there are a couple of things going on in that question. I'll answer the part about why economists don't get behind this and leave the policy and politics. Maybe uh, the politician here could have that side of it. Uh, you know, it, within economics, there is this thing called the Phillips curve, and maybe I can say that in a room like this where so many uh, law students have done economics at some point in their uh, training. But there was this idea for many, many years that there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, and an inverse relationship. So the only way you get lower unemployment is to tolerate higher inflation. And we have these things like the NIRU, the non-accelerating inflationary unemployment rate. These are fancy things economists make up to wow and dazzle one another. We economists used to believe that this um, special unemployment rate was 6%. That if you push the unemployment rate below 6%, inflation begins to increase. Okay, And if you go back and you read the transcripts from the meetings of the Open Market Committee, the Federal Reserve Group that makes the policy, sets interest rate policy, during the Clinton expansion, or the expansion that, that took place under Clinton, uh, if you go back and read those transcripts, you'll find that the members of the Open Market Committee were having these debates. And you had these two different groups. They called themselves the wolves and the owls. The wolves were completely convinced that inflation was right around the corner and that rates needed to go up, interest rates should rise. The elves, Alice Rivlin and some of the others, she was vice chair, she, they said, I think it's possible, and Greenspan agreed, that we can push growth and allow unemployment to go down without inflation becoming a problem. And he was paying attention to the fact that productivity was growing fairly rapidly during that time. So they start talking about, is it possible that the NIRU has fallen? Maybe it's 5%. So they didn't raise interest rates. The economy plugged along. Output increased. Unemployment fell. And inflation remained non-existent. They all started saying, I think the NIRU really did fall. I think it's 5%. And then they had to meet again and decide on interest rates. And they said, I think the, the uh, wolf said, we got to raise rates. Inflation's right around the corner. And the elf said, no, I think we can go lower. And they had this debate. And it's fascinating. And, and then they started saying, is it possible that the NIRU is 4%? Because the unemployment rate fell to 4%. Inflation didn't become a problem. And they thought maybe the number was moving. Um, but the idea that there is still this belief that there's a number out there somewhere and we can't get too close to that number. Now, what they've been doing lately is talking that number up, right? Maybe the NIRU is 8%, and this is the new normal, and we're just going to have to live with this because if, if we can't really safely go lower. You want to take the rest of it? Can you, take yeah. I mean, can you answer the question of why does why, why the system not adopt what you're saying? Yeah. It, it, so if we look, before, last year we had the debt ceiling drama. Remember that last summer? And before, right after the State of the Union, Paul Ryan got up and said, look, the U.S. could be the next Greece. We're going to be on our knees to the IMF. Interest rates are going to spike. We might get downgraded. We might default. We have to take $10 trillion out of the deficit. And we're not going to vote for the debt ceiling increase unless we do that. And Obama actually agreed. The president agreed. He had a plan to take six trillion out, but they didn't like what each other was doing. <clears throat> they got right down to the wire. They kicked the can down the road with a compromise. Interest rates had gone up in anticipation of something terrible happening. The stock market was crashing, and we got downgraded by Standard Poor's. And what happened? Okay, interest rates went down instead of up. Three-month Treasury bills were going through at zero percent. You know, everybody's going, like, what's going on? How is this possible? No move on the deficit. We're up over 16 trillion. And 
you know, this was supposed to be the end of the world. And then suddenly it sort of coming out. You had Alan Greenspan come out and said, well, you know, we print our own money. And Warren Buffett came out and said, we're four A's, not three A's, because set the Fed Reserve prints the money. So I compare this to the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans was fought after the war was over. <laughs> and the winner, Andrew Jackson, became president for winning this battle after the war was over. Anyway, so what's happened is, that moment when they came out and realized that we weren't going to be the next Greece, okay, that the U.S. was not going to be at its knees, that deficits don't drive interest rates up, and there's absolutely no reason to think they would when you understand monetary operations, they never do. The war was over, okay, we had won the war. We, the reason for deficit reduction was gone. It disappeared. All the reasons that you know, Ryan and Obama had all, we've run out of money, all these things were over, okay? But they kept fighting the war anyway. And it's kind of the strangest thing. There's, they just started pushing ahead with, okay, now we got to do it towards the end of the year. And nobody talked about Greece for a while. And then now all of a sudden in the last few months, you're starting to hear Greece sneak into it again. Okay, that war is over. You're right. It should be over. Okay, the, the, we know the deficits don't cause any default risk, they don't cause interest rates, but they don't cause any of that. Now, they might cause inflation if we overspend, but let me say two things on that. Japan's been trying to inflate with hard as it can for 20 years and hasn't managed to get out of deflation. Okay. The Federal Reserve has been trying to inflate with everything it's got, every trick in the book, every tool it can imagine for four years and hasn't done it. It's failed, utterly failed. It's not that easy. And I've been writing for years, and there's some people here on my mailing list, that central banks cannot cause inflation no matter what they do. And I think we've seen that proven out. Okay, So number one, inflation is not that easy. The, the causes of these other things are all special circumstances of all the hyperinflations. I won't get into that. So, but if there is any reason to think that we do need deficit reduction, that we should cut spending or raise taxes, it has to be inflation, because none of the other things or a factor. So let's look at our inflation forecast. There isn't one analyst out there whose reputation, you know, who has a reputation to defend this, that's forecasting any kind of inflation. The Treasury index bonds, 30 years, are forecasting very, very low inflation. There's not a single inflation forecast out there. So I talked to um, uh, Representative, uh, what's his name, Hollings. He's on the Deficit Reduction Committee from Virginia. He's a progressive Democrat. I said, why, okay, the war's over. Why are you pushing for cuts in Social Security, cuts in Medicare? Isn't the burden of proof on the other side to tell you that we have to cut or else there's going to be inflation? Maybe they have to do a little research and prove to you that there could be inflation and therefore we have to cut Social Security and Medicare? Because there's certainly no forecast out there. Why are you just voluntarily, the left, the progressive Democrats, out there proposing these cuts? Uh, he goes, well, it's a pretty large number, and I think we need to do something about it. It's like, what? <laughs> okay, there's something very wrong with the political process. And, and I think what's happened is they've become victims of their own propaganda. And they've gotten it so instilled in people that we have to do something about the deficit. They can't even begin to talk otherwise, even though they know the war is over, even though they know they've lost any possible reason for it, even though they know the burden of proof is on the other side now to show that spending needs to be cut or taxes need to be raised or whatever for some, for some reason. And the polls show that if they come out there and, and the reactions show that if they come out and aren't for deficit reduction, they get laughed off the stage and they, and they lose their spot. Okay, And, and so they're, this is, the, war, the battle of New Orleans being fought after the war is over because people don't realize the war is over. In their heads. And so even though the policy members might know that, they're going on dealing with a population that doesn't know it. And it's just an economic disaster and a, and a real tragedy. And uh, I'm going to say one more thing about taxes, if I can, and, uh, and the size of government. So I want to make this entirely apolitical, which it should be. The size of the government is a political question. How many teachers do we want in the classrooms? How many soldiers do we want in the army? If you take too many, there'll be nobody left to grow the food, and we're going to starve. If you take too few, we're going to lose the war. 
These are all political decisions of what resources we want moved from the private sector to the public sector. And you'll have differences of opinion. Some people think we need more government. Some people think we have less government. But once we've settled politically on the right size government, then there is an appropriate level of taxes that allows the right size deficit so we have the right amount of savings to offset our pension needs and stay at full employment. So given that the size of the government is a political decision that shouldn't be based on whether the economy's good or bad. We need a legal system. How many judges and clerks do we need? Well, you know, if there's a 10 year wait, maybe we need more. If they're calling you up asking you to see, why don't you go out and sue somebody? We have people waiting around to try to have trial. Maybe, maybe we've got too many of them in here, right? See, so you've got to come up with the right size for the legal system and everything else. Once you've done that, taxes are the thermostat on the wall. If, unemployment, if the economy's ice cold and unemployment's high, you're taking too much money out for the size government we have, and you need lower taxes for that size government. If, on the other hand, it's overheating, there's too much spending, and prices are going up too fast, and unemployment's too low, whatever that means, then taxes have to be raised, because for the size of government we have, uh, taxes aren't high enough. We're not taking enough money out, okay? So for this right size government, taxes are the thermostat on the wall. It's, they're not there to balance the budget to bring in money. We're just changing numbers down. We're changing numbers up. The deficits are residual. You find out afterwards if it was a right size deficit by counting the bodies in the unemployment line not by worrying about paying it back and becoming grease and all that nonsense. There is no such thing. Okay, so how, your question now is, why can't the political process get us there? And so I'm, now that you know all this, I'm going to ask you for the answer on that. Because <laughs> it's becoming more of a mystery every day, because the more people I know, the more people I know who know the right answer, you know, it's almost like the less willing they are. I talked for hours to Senator uh, Blumenthal. He read my book. Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds, you can get it free online, it's an easy read. And he gets the whole thing and he won't do anything. He just sits there. Same with Lieberman from Connecticut. I ran for Senate in Connecticut a couple of years ago. Talked to these people, I talked to Hollins, I've talked to all kinds of people over the years. And uh, they're not gonna be the ones, I don't think, to, to move us off the dime on this. We've got the academic community starting to get some of the right answers and through the blogs and Stephanie's done a wonderful job on in the blog. You want to promote that for a few minutes if you want blogs to read. I've got mine, MoserEconomics.com. I forget your, it's a new economic perspective, but what's the? Dot com. Dot com, okay. And, and it's called MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. Somebody gave it a name. We don't particularly, wouldn't be the name we chose, but it's it's been expanding rapidly. We got a very nice write-up in The Economist early in the year in the Washington Post. Article was just up there on the screen. Uh, it's certainly mentioned and moved up in discussions, but it's not there. What the only thing between us and full employment and prosperity beyond what anyone can imagine is the space between our ears. There's nothing else in the way right now. We're, there's no food shortage. There's no shortage of housing. We have surpluses of everything. 